Well, so glad everybody's here. Beautiful sunny day outside. Um, I know that I took in a little bit. We'll see how that goes the afternoon, but uh, great day. God has blessed us, and a, a, of all days, now it's time to start, um, of all days to, to think of the hope and the celebration of a risen Lord that just in the scope of things at the cross, there, there was at the very least a moment, an extended moment, where Satan believed he had won. And imagine the crushing blow against darkness when the stone was rolled away and Jesus was alive. And what happened so long ago was not just a crushing blow for the moment or for those who were present, But it continues to be one of the greatest hopes of the Christian to this day. And so, of course, we're going to talk about uh, the resurrection this morning uh, and and, um, not only what it it means through what Jesus offered us, but what it means in our individual lives. And and just because uh, things need titles, and so I've titled this, I won't reference this a whole lot, but there is a beautiful song, uh, The King of Love My Shepherd Is. Uh, that I have not been able to get out of my head the last couple of weeks. It just kind of keeps playing. And that idea that, that, that a king, one with power, one with authority, uh, a king of love, not, not like your common king, uh, but one who has our best interests in mind, one who, as John has alluded to in the gospel we've been studying, is the good shepherd, one of our souls, one who has our everlasting care in mind, the king of love my shepherd is. And so just to put that on your mind this morning, uh, we'll be headed that direction. I can't even tell you who sings the song. It's something like we are they or me is them. It's, it's, it's along those lines. So you'll find it if you want to listen to it, but really, really good song. So uh, let's talk about the resurrection. This is, this is the principal tenet of scripture. Really, the New Testament focuses on the power of this resurrection as its main hub. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus is a testimony of the general resurrection of all humans that that, that is going to be followed by this dispensing of justice by God to the righteous, we are told in the Bible, there will be a resurrection to life and to the unrighteous, a resurrection to condemnation. And so here's this idea that is presented to Christians. And if you compare that with how the Old Testament starts, there's kind of a different idea. The, the hope of the Old Testament was the Messiah was the one who would come and deliver this promise through himself. Uh, It was the idea that that, that one is coming that will lead us, that will deliver us. And so we pick up the New Testament. And Jesus, is, who's been promised all this time, is born. And he's given this name, Emmanuel, which is God with us. Think of all that time that had elapsed. God's people, God's children, God's nation waiting and waiting and waiting. And now God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ. And when, as you follow the New Testament, that sinless Son of God gives His life on the cruel Roman cross, we see once and for all that God's not just slightly interested in us. He's all in that God is for us, that this king would die for his people. One, undeserving of the cruelty, unworthy of that death, would freely give his life for love for us. And then, finally, the Holy Spirit is given after the resurrection as a guarantee, as a first installment of all that God had promised for his people. And we see then that God is in us. So if you put the whole thing together, you realize that God is is, is in this continual effort trying to win our attention and win our eyes on Him and to look into the love that He forever has for us. But I would say this this morning, the resurrection of Jesus is a down payment on so much more that God wants to do. And it's been the focus of Christians for almost 2,000 years, not only because of what it accomplished, because of the hope it still holds out, that there is still something yet to come. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is the power by which all of us can be released from the bondage of sin and of death, but there is still more to come. If you want to look in your Bibles, I'm going to read just a quick text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 2. And the more still to come is kind of summed up here in that Jesus is going to um, raise the righteous from the dead, that there is this life post-life, that that. Physical life is not the end of those who are going to follow Jesus, that there's something more to come, and that when we face that life, we will not be, as Paul says, found naked, but we'll have this existence permanently with God. And so here's the wording he uses in 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 2. He says, but now we groan in this tent. What a, 
What a great way to think about this body we live in now. A tent. It's temporary. It's not meant to be permanent. It will pass away. It will, it will be done away with. And so we want God to give us, he goes on to say, our heavenly home. Because it will clothe us so we will not be naked. And while we live in this body, we have burdens and we groan. We do not, not want to be naked, but we want to be clothed with our heavenly home. Then this body that dies will be fully covered in life. Imagine the hope that the resurrection of Jesus still holds out for us. And yet to have that hope in mind, a home with Him, where we will be present with Him, together with Him forever, means that in this life, our goal is to seek to please Him. Because after all, Paul goes on to say in verses 6 through 10, that we're going to give an account for the life that we live and how we live in the tent we live in now. And so he says, starting at verse 6, so we always have courage. We know that while we live in this body, we are always from the Lord, away from the Lord. Uh, we live by what we believe, not by what we can see. So I, I say that we have courage. We really want to be away from this body and be at home with the Lord. Our only goal is to please God, whether we live here or there, because we must all stand before Christ to be judged. Each of us will receive what we should get, good or bad, for all the things we did in this earthly tent. And so in this end game, this idea that forever we will live with God, there's this hope that by living for Him here, we will live with Him forever. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to just read largely through the text of the end of the Gospel of John. I want to see what John says about this, this resurrection um, appearances of Jesus Christ, how he shows up to his disciples, a few other people in this text. And I just want you to sit on and think in the text. Because this is so much the heart of who we are as Christians, the hope that we hold out. And I don't have a lot of stories in this. You know, there, there are times to realize that the Bible is enough story, that, that there's, a, there's enough there if we'll open our not only ears, but hearts to really pour in and begin to change and shape the way we think. And so I want you to imagine yourself. Having been one of those who followed Jesus for three years of your life, and remember, it wasn't at little cost. They left their livelihoods, they left their families, and they started to follow a man who simply said, follow me. And on the road, they went with Jesus, and they saw things that they hadn't seen before, miracles. People cured, people healed. And they saw love like they had never seen before, as we mentioned last week. They, they saw a man connect through prayer to God like they had never seen before. And so they learned and they gleaned from the teacher all the way to the garden before the cross. And it seems like when it really got hot, when things really got tense, oh no, they tried in their own ways to hang on for a moment, but it wasn't long before they all had scattered. And I, I have a hard time actually picturing what the hopelessness of Friday night and Saturday must have felt like for the 12. The hopelessness of how good we had it, and now it's gone. You see, in all their learning and all their listening, they seem to have missed the idea that the Messiah must suffer, that the Messiah must die, that Jesus, the one and only Son of God, was laying down His life, and when it happened, they despaired. And I have to think they were so downcast that it wasn't the 12, but Mary. John 20, verse 1, who early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. And when she saw that large stone had been moved away from the tomb, she ran to Simon Peter and the follower whom Jesus loved. And Mary said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. You know, the rumor that the body of Jesus had been stolen, I guess, started first with his own followers. They, they just had not made the connection of what was going on. He must have been taken, verse 3. So Peter and the other followers started for the tomb, and they both were running. And I, and I first of all, just want to put in here as you read this text, John never says his own name. Uh, he is just that other disciple for a while, and then kind of sleight of hand becomes the disciple Jesus loves at the end. You might as well just write it in here. He's the disciple faster than Peter. Uh, because they get in a foot race, and John gets there first. And it goes a little something like this. As they come running as fast as they can to the tomb, John stops and starts to look in. And as Peter catches up, he just runs right in, verse 6. And he sees 
the strips of linen cloth lying there. And he saw the cloth that had been around Jesus' head, which was folded up and laid in a different place from the strips of linen. I just want you to imagine, by the way, you read cloth, you read covering, you read clothes. A man who was brutally tortured to death was wrapped in these clothes. There was evidence of that laying there. And the other follower who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. In verse 9, they did not yet understand from the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. And then the followers went back home. I I don't know. (laughs) Nothing more we can do. Uh, he, he isn't here, might as well go home. But notice, it's Mary, again in verse 11, who stands outside the tomb and she's crying. And as she's crying, she bent down and she looked into the tomb and there she sees two angels dressed in white sitting where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the feet. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she answered, they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they've put him. When Mary said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And so Jesus asked her, woman, why are you crying? Whom are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said to him, did you take him away, sir? Tell me where you put him, and I will get him. And wouldn't you love to know what's on the heart of Mary here? All she wants is her Lord back, dead or alive. She just needs to know, where is he? Who's taken him? Where have you put him? I'll, I'll put him back myself. Just tell me where he's gone. And that's when Jesus then reveals himself to her. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And there's something going on in this text where people looking at the presence of Jesus here don't fully recognize him. But I find it interesting that he uses his voice John has alluded many times to Jesus being this shepherd, this good shepherd, John chapter 10. And one of the things Jesus says about that is, my sheep know my voice, and they'll hear it. And it's this this dawning on moment where the shepherd has called, and the sheep hears, and she turns toward Jesus, and she says in the Hebrew language, Rabboni, which is teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me. Can you imagine? I'm clingy. I, I, was, I was desperate without you. I didn't, I didn't know how I would live without you. I mean, just, just the, don't leave me again. The feeling of that, and yet Jesus is already preparing her for the fact that I may be risen, but I'm not sticking around here. I've not yet gone on, he says, to see my Father yet. I'm going back to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and said to the followers, I saw the Lord, and she told them what Jesus had said to her. And so verse 19, when it was evening on the first day of the week, Jesus' followers were together, and the doors were locked because they were afraid of the elders. And then Jesus came and stood right in the middle of them and said, Peace be with you. So many things happen in the wording there, but number one, They've heard he's alive in the morning. They've waited till evening to gather together, and they're still terrified their doors are locked. And through locked doors, a resurrected Jesus appears. And there he stands, knowing they're frightened, and says what only a loving shepherd of our souls would say, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and his followers were thrilled when they saw the Lord. And then Jesus said again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I now send you. And he said this, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. I just imagine this scene. I mean, you've, you've had that friend or child who's upset. Be calm, child. Doesn't seem to cover it once. Be calm. Peace be with you. Peace. There had to be this kind of calming of the nerves and this actual physical touching of, see me. You you, you saw me taken away from this world, but I'm alive. It's me. I'm here. Be at peace. I did not leave you alone. And then through his breath, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, this, this coming understanding of what is going on. And of course, as would tend to happen, when, when they are gathered, not all are there. It's Thomas, as we read in verse 24, who isn't there. 
one of the 12. You see, when Jesus came, it's, it's not, and I've read this before in my life where I just thought, why when Thomas sees Jesus, doesn't he just say, yeah, I get it, that's him. But he actually makes the statement, unless I see, unless I touch. And Well, the reason he says it is that's what they saw and touched. And he wants that experience. And so the other followers in verse 25, they keep telling him, you missed it. We saw the Lord, but Thomas says, I, I'm not going to believe that. I'm not taking your word for that until I see the nail marks in his hands. I put my finger where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side. I mean, as graphic as all of that sounds, he says, you put your hands on the Lord. I want to put my hands on I want to know for myself. I want to see this myself. You notice verse 26. Not everything we want from the Lord comes immediately. It was a week later. The followers were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came in and stood right in the middle of them, and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand here in my side. Stop being an unbeliever and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him, You believe because you see me. Those who believe without seeing me, will truly be blessed. And then John makes this little insert in verses 30 and 31. See, everything we've been reading, everything coming to this climax was about this. He says, Jesus did many other miracles in the presence of his followers that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Then by believing, you may have life through his name. And so chapter 21 begins with later. Jesus showed himself to his followers again, this time at the lake. And again, this is one of those moments where having appeared to his disciples, it just takes a little while for it to sink in. Who is this vision? Who is this person? And so this is how he showed himself. Some of them uh, were together, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, and the two sons of Zebedee, that's John and James, and two other followers. And Simon Peter said, I'm going out to fish. And the other said, we'll go with you. And so they went out, and they got in a boat, and they fished that night, and they caught nothing. And I've often thought about this. Jesus is alive, but we don't know much what to do about that. He's appeared here, and he's appeared here, but now what? And a week had passed, and now more time has passed. And Peter has to start thinking the traveling's over, the teaching's over. I mean, he's gone. We better go back to work. I, I read this Peter saying, I'm going fishing, not like Bill would say, let's go fishing. He says, I'm getting back to my life. We, we did that thing, and, and, and he's alive. But now it's time to take care of ourselves, and the rest say, okay, well, let's go. And they begin to fish, and they fish all night, and they don't catch anything, and this isn't like me catching nothing all night. They know what they're doing. They're professionals at this, and nothing comes into the boat. In verse 4, early the next morning, Jesus stood there on the shore. But the followers did not know it was Jesus, and they... He said to them, friends, did you catch any fish? I, I just love the fact that our Lord is not beyond asking the question that he already knows the answer to. By the way, he knows everything. But he's working his disciples through this path. What are you doing? I called you to be fishers of men. You're back there fishing for fish. Well, how'd that go for you? Seems to be the reading here. And they said, not very well, Lord. We didn't catch a fish. And he said, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll find some. And so they did. And they caught so many fish that they couldn't pull the net back into the boat. And the follower whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now you've read through the beginning of John. You recognize this is a callback to a scene that first got them to throw their nets to the side and go fishing for men. And it's a callback to that. The rare little bit of difference here is there's no breaking of the net. Jesus allows them to pull all of these fish in. And recognizing it's the Lord, Peter hears John say this. He wraps himself with his coat around him because he had stripped himself to work. And then he just jumps into the water. Now, just like he slowly ran to the tomb, he decides, I guess I got a better shot of getting there first by swimming. And the others follow, and they take the boat to shore, dragging the full net of fish. And they're, we're not very far from shore, only about 100 yards. And when the followers stepped out of the boat and onto the shore, they saw a fire on hot coals. And there were fish on the fire, and there was some bread. And then Jesus said, bring some of the fish you just caught. And Simon Peter went into the boat, and he pulled the net to shore. And it was full of big fish, 153 in all. But even though there were so many, the net did not tear. And Jesus said to them, come and eat. 
I have highlighted in, in my New American Standard version, it's come and have breakfast which may be the all-time favorite thing I've ever heard Jesus say, apart from your sins of pardon. We have a Savior that did not just want to set us free from sin. He wants to be with us, to eat with us. And there on the shore, knowing he's soon to, to, to rise, not only from the dead, but into heaven to ascend, to leave his disciples here, he wants to enjoy this meal. And I've often looked at this simple meal. For me, the only disappointment is the serving fish, uh, just not a breakfast food, but the communion, the, the idea of togetherness, the sharing. And that for centuries, Christians have remembered that Jesus has brought us to his table. He said, come and eat. And that in this partaking of bread and fruit of the vine that we, we remember every week for the giving of his body and the shedding of his blood. It isn't something we do just in some distant memory, but he says, as you do it and eat it in my kingdom, I'm there with you in your midst. Jesus has always wanted to gather around the table with us. And it's good for us to think about what being at the table with Jesus means. Although in verse 12, when he says, come and eat, none of his followers yet dared ask him, who are you? But They knew it was the Lord. So Jesus came and he took bread and he gave it to them along with a fish. And this was the third time Jesus showed himself to his followers after he was raised from the dead. Now, that's a lengthy reading and a lot of text there to put in your mind. But, but I will tell you this, as quickly as we got through that, that had to pass like that to those men. Because it's not long after when Luke records that they were standing there staring into heaven as Jesus ascended. And it seemed like he was with them and he slipped away. But that's not the point of Scripture. You see, the God with us, the God for us, the God in us has never abandoned us. He is always with us. And so there are a lot of messages in this. And I'm just going to quickly go through some points to put on this text for us, uh, uh, to set on our minds and our hearts this morning. And the first is this, that, that the fact that Jesus raised from the dead brings to us many blessings. And, and just the first few that I could kind of point out or think about is, number one, the fact that Jesus is not in that tomb. You realize that's how Peter's preaching in Acts begins. You go find his tomb, he's not there. The fact that there's a tomb empty in Jerusalem means that there is hope for a future resurrection for all of us. You see, because Jesus both died and rose again, we will rise and live again. We are the first fruits, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15 and verse 20, he says, but, but Christ has truly been raised from the dead. Well, what's that mean for us? Well, he's the first one in proof that those who sleep in death will also be raised. Death has come because of what one man did. The rising from the dead also comes because of one man. In Adam, all of us die. But in the same way in Christ, all of us will be made alive. Again, you see, Jesus has died and has risen. So we know that our resurrected bodies will in some way resemble his. And I'm sure there's a couple rabbit trails here. What exactly will this body look like? What exactly will that be? I, I usually stop short of all those trails and just imagine it's going to be awesome. Like in the real sense of the word. Because what's going to happen when that takes place, as John tells us in 1 John 3, 2, he says, dear friends, now we are children of God. And we don't yet know, it's not been shown to us, what we're going to be in the future. But one thing we know is that when Christ comes, we'll be like Him because we will see Him as He really is. There's something about that that'll be the same as the Lord. You see, it's always been God's intention, not just to have one child, but many children, but for those many children to be just like His one and only Son. And there's hope in that because Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, I didn't put this one up here. Uh, but another thing that this brings, the resurrection of Jesus, is the promise of a future judgment. And, and I get it. That doesn't sound too exciting, but it's something we all must remember. We live in a society, a world, in which justice is often perverted or just neglected altogether. It's, it's kind of, you got the power, you got the rules, who you step on, who you abuse, it just goes overlooked so often in this world. In fact, things happen around us all the time where we think, really? How is this going on? How is this allowed to still happen? And the resurrection of Jesus actually points to this reminder that among other things, God's 
permanent and final justice will sit over the righteous and the wicked all together. That all will be judged and God will finally have justice. you got to remember that. You know, the resurrection of Jesus does show the wrath of God in His death, but the justice of God in that the righteousness of Jesus could not be kept dead. And it's a promise of a future judgment for all. There's a, a third promise here that it brings. Uh, that, and again, there's many, but I just was going to put some thoughts on our head. Um, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the resurrection of Jesus gives us power to live the Christian life. Th this, again, is the idea in Romans 8, verse 11. It says, God raised Jesus from the dead, and if God's Spirit is living in you, He will also give you life to your bodies that die. There's the resurrection. God is the one who raised Christ from the dead, and He will give life through His Spirit that lives in you. So it's not just the resurrection, but it's the life you live now. Now, certainly you've picked up on this theme. When you become a child of God, the Bible doesn't tell you, from now on you live sinlessly. But certainly it reminds us that through the gift of the Spirit that lives in us, the indwelling of God's Spirit, we sin less. Certainly we know when we're grieving the Spirit, and the Spirit gives us the power to live a life that in our own ability we cannot live. Listen, there's none of you with enough self-discipline, enough self-will, enough pick-yourself-up-by-the-bootstrap mentality to get this Christian life lived without the help of God. So not only did Jesus die to set you free from the sins you've sinned and to give you access to that blood as you sin continually, He gives you the Spirit to help you live in a way that pleases Him. You see, Christ makes us all together different people. And we have to believe that. In fact, in a subtle way, this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, if anyone belongs to Christ, there's a new creation. The old things have gone. Everything is made new. And I, I think about this a lot because there's so many days when I don't look like the new so much, I look a lot more like the old. And there's a reminder then, I'm not looking or leaning in the right direction. I'm not listening to the leading of the Spirit. I'm not leaning on and trusting in the salvation of God. We've got to remember this. God can give you the power to live the life that He's asked us to live. So Jesus' resurrection from the dead is not only a miracle. It's a climactic part of God's plan to save us. And so we see that here. And when Jesus rose from the dead, He proved His command over death and over Satan and over hell. And everyone who is in Christ receives the benefits of that victory. And if you're not sure what those benefits are, I just want to spend the last little bit talking about some of those. Here's, here's what it means to us. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus means to us freedom. John 14, verse 19. In a little while, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. You see, Jesus is rising from the dead, broke the power, the chains, the bondage that sin had on us. We are no longer slaves to that. We are set free. When we're buried with Jesus Christ, when we accept what His sacrifice brings to us on our behalf, His victory over sin is imputed to us. We carry that. And the Holy Spirit enables us to live a life of victory. You know, I've seen this so many times. That's why the, the person's life, as you, if you've known them early on, just completely turns around. I've seen um, addicts just com completely change their focus in life. Uh, worked with alcoholics for years and watched. And, and again, I just want to say this for all of us. As our life changes, for some of us, it's more gradual. It isn't that God's power is less. It's sometimes our focus. But it's there. It's available. There's this freedom from what once held us now to pursue what we truly love. You see, as we seek Christ and know Him more each day, we just learn to walk this line of victory. My old doubts, my old idea of who I am no longer holds any weight on me. I see what God wants me to see. I am who He says I am. And as we do, we find more and more freedom in the resurrection of Christ. Here's the, another blessing it brings. It, it to us means security. John 5, 24 says, if you, uh, I tell you the truth, whoever hears what I say and believes in the one 
who sent me has eternal life. That person will not be judged guilty, but has already left death and entered life. And for all the questions I have about a final resurrection, there is a sense in which it's already happened. Like I, I, I'm raising up from the watery grave to walk with Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm living that life now. It's what led the guy, Paul, the Apostle Paul, to say something like, I'm not a Roman. Uh, I don't really claim Tarsus. You know, if you really want to pin me down to it, I am a citizen of heaven. What, what makes a person think that way? They're living that life now. And John certainly points that way. There's this security that Christ gives us through this resurrection. You see, when, when Jesus stood in our place and took the penalty that we deserved on that cross, that was the first step of securing our place in heaven. And when he rose the third day, he just confirmed that place. For everyone who has believed in Him. That, that, that is a reservation made that is kept. We have it securely made. And so Jesus is now with the Father. And He's prepared this place for us. And one day, we will stand in His company with other believers, celebrating the fact that what He gave us, no one took away. It was secure. And I would just point out that if you're worried about the security of your salvation, if you wonder, have I done enough? Look, if you've got your trust in this one, he's holding your place at the table. Your security does not rest on you, but on him. And praise God, it does. He's the one who raised from the dead. And because of his perfect righteousness, his perfect faithfulness to his promise, you know you are secure. Here's another one. The resurrection of Jesus points to a real hope. Love this thought in Job 19, and just for a brief bit of context, here's a man who, by all accounts, has lost everything. His family, their lives, uh, material wealth, a plan for today and a vision for tomorrow, even his own health. And as Job sees everything stripped away, he, he doesn't keep lamenting over all things lost. He starts Remembering that, that there is something coming. There is this hope. There is, there, is, there is a place that I can put everything I am and everything I want, and it is secure there. And so he says, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and He will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see Him for myself. Yes, I will see Him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. What, what a way to grieve by the way. You strip what you want away from me in this life. There is something that no one can take away, and I know that my Redeemer lives. And by the way, Job, He did stand upon this earth and carry our sins to the cross, and now we know and hope that His resurrection means we will be raised from the dead and see Him and be with Him forever as well. You see, Jesus is available to us in life's most difficult circumstances. And even if those circumstances don't change, we look forward to a blessed hope on the other side of death. You see, like Jesus, and because of him, we will die. But when we do, we'll be resurrected to life and eternal life beyond this world. And here's one I just wanted to, to leave with. Jesus being raised from the dead means to all of us we have a new relationship. I, I love the way Peter words this. He says, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Born again into a living hope. What a beautiful thought. You're reborn, re, re, rebirth, we done away with one completely, and now something new has come up. And, and what's happened in that new birth is this living, active hope. See, God in His mercy made a way for us to have a relationship with Him, and that is the whole story of the Bible. God created the world for relationship. God created mankind for relationship. And one thing, character after character, man after man, woman after woman, in all of human history has proven is we're not really good at relationship. But God never gave up. He never quit. To the point of sending His only perfect Son to die in our place. God has done 
everything he can, moved heaven and earth so that we could have a relationship with him. And yeah, that plan required that Jesus come in the form of a baby and live in this fallen world. I, I remember intensely bringing our first baby home from the hospital and how ill-equipped I felt as a provider and protector of that little soul in this world. And that God's son came, thrown, in, thrown into the wreck, raised among the masses of, of sin, sick, sin-starved people, or righteous-starved people. And he just loved them, and he loved them. He patiently bore with them, and he took our sins and sacrificed himself for the very people that, that hurt him. And yet his story didn't end there. His resurrection proved that even death had no hold over God's ultimate power. You see, what, what God was hoping for through Jesus Christ was that we would recognize how great his love was for us and cling to that relationship. Now, Satan had a couple bets here. One was, God, you can't do it. Don't ever bet against God. The other was he bet against us. And I will say this, Satan has one role left in judgment. He will stand and he will convict. He will stand and he will accuse all of us before Christ. And in this one role, he's going to tell the truth. He will be right about all he said I've done. I have no claim to eternity in heaven. I have no claim on the splendor of heaven. I have no claim to be in the presence of God except for by God's mercy I was born again to a living hope. You see, Satan's best plan was foiled, and we've been invited in. And that's something to celebrate today and every day. Give you a few last kind of pictures here when it comes to the resurrection. This was strongly on my mind. And because we're going to partake the Lord's Supper together, I thought I would just, just say this as a, as a conclusion. But baptism itself is centered on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You you can look in history, there, there are hundreds of years of evidence of the Jews using some form of baptism for many other things. I, um, I know those accounts exist, but, but Paul takes that to a whole other level. You see, Paul applies the act of baptism symbolically to death, burial, and resurrection. And I know what you're thinking. If you want people to be baptized, tell them it's about death. But, but I, I know this in having taught the gospel over the years. And we mentioned this a little bit in Brian's class in Psalm 51. Recognizing your own sin and worthlessness is a very, very difficult task. And when you get there, there's very little to make you want to live again with any kind of hope. It's God. It's God who takes you out of that. And so when you start to recognize in the contrast of God's love and God's light what your life is, and you come to that moment of despair, I'll tell you, that's when this death looks good. Because it's a washing, it's a cleansing, it's a removal of those things we've done to ourselves so that we can have a relationship with God. And so here are some of the pictures that Paul puts in our head. He says, when you're baptized, you're buried with Christ. You go back to the tomb. He lay there dead. Baptism is this idea of, of the ruin I've made of my life, the wreck I've made by pursuing self over God. This can be undone, but it has to die first. And so there, with Christ, we die. And then you're raised up with Him through your faith in God's power that was shown when He raised Christ from the dead. Look, if there's any doubt that God can do it, we can't overcome my sin. No, I might, I might deserve to die for this, but there's no way He can make me live again. If you've got any doubt, Paul says, you just go right to the empty tomb. Because the God who raised Jesus from the dead is waiting to make you rise from those waters a new creature. Here's another way he puts it in Romans 6 at verse 3. He said, did you forget that all of us became part of Christ when we were baptized? I just, I love the thought. You see, the implication is you can start to live this Christian life and become so burdened down by life itself or so troubled over misconceptions of God's word that you wonder, what's this really all about? And he says, don't forget, you joined Christ. You died with him and you joined him. We shared his death in our baptism. When we were baptized, we were buried with Christ and shared his death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the wonderful power of the Father, we also can live a new life. Christ died. 
And we have been joined with him by dying too. So we will also be joined with him by rising from the dead as he did. What a hope. What a promise. And then finally, Peter picks up this mantle. He says in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, he says, look, God, God was waiting patiently in the times of Noah who was building a boat. I, I love that Peter brings in this, this salvation of Noah picture because God, God always wanted relationship. And as you read the Bible, what you've become very convinced of is that in order to bring about a Messiah, it took an awful lot of work from God because the people were constantly straying and there were often very few people even left. And in this one case, it was Noah and his family and the rest of the world's about to be destroyed. And so it's through water. It's the image of God making a way that they pass through safely to a point of salvation by listening to God and responding to God. A result is different for Noah and his family. It was aid in all and they were saved by water. And he says that idea that God is making a way is still present today. It's the water that's like that in baptism. It now saves you. Not the washing of dirt from the body. And to those hundreds of old years old illusions I pointed to, Peter saying, this is not a ceremonial rite. It's not a visible outward cleansing. It's not you showing a washing that says, God, look what I've done. This is not a removal of dirt from the body. It is, a, it is the promise made to God for a good conscience. And this is because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I wonder how many of us have thought about our baptism that way. God, I made you a promise. As we get ready to partake this morning, I want you to think about this. Those of you who are Christians are about to remember the sacrifice Christ made, his body and his blood. I want you to remember that in your baptism, you made God a promise, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to live by the power of your resurrection. And, and, and here's a thing you need to put onto that promise. You need to recognize that God already knew you would make many mistakes and there would be many moments of failure. It's, it's not like that surprised him. You just need to remember your promise and go back to that time where God, now help me, lead me, that I might follow you closer. Let's just say this today as we think about what it means that Christ is risen. As you can talk about, you can study, and you can seek to understand the resurrection all that you want. But the reality is God asks you to share in it. In being born again, raising in newness of life, and in hope of being raised again one day to live with God forever. You see, you could die with him now, and you could be raised with him now, and you can have that hope ever before you. Well, let's come around the table now. If you have your communion with you, we're going to take the bread here in just a moment. The bread is the picture of the body of Jesus Christ. Lots, lots to say about that. Um, in his body, he carried our sin. Uh, we have a few more that need some up here. Ava, why don't you go get a couple? Um, in his body, he was beaten. His flesh was torn. And he suffered and he died. There, there, there is a, an evidence that he, he was God's son that was prophesied before he came, and that was that in his dying, not a bone would be broken. Something common to, to Roman crucifixion was to, to speed along the death. It was not humane. It had already gone on too long is the idea. The legs were broken so the body could no longer take in air and breathe. But see, one, one last evidence that John gives that Jesus Christ was not a man. He was a man and was God that he gave his life, it wasn't just taken from him, it was that he breathed his last and his bones were not broken on that cross. So we take this bread in remembrance of the unique body, one able to bear the curse that was on us, one that was on that cross able to cancel out all our transgression and all our debts. And so as you remember that in our crucified Lord, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you want to have a relationship with us, that you give us all the hope we need to keep, to keep working through this life and leaning on you more, that, that you've put in our mind is, these truths that allow us to live a new life here. And Father, we just pray as we, we look to your Son that we be recommitted and promise again today to follow you closer, to seek relationship more, because we know how much it means to you. And we love you. Father, above all, we see your love in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so as we take this bread, 
We pray your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine yourself again at the table. Um, they had shared this feast with Christ before his death. This, this reminder centered around a lamb who shed blood, removed their sins. They'd watched Jesus go to the hill and die, and he had risen. And when this Lord's Supper was instituted, there was this reminder that this is what, what you'll do. You'll take account of your life. You'll remember your promises, and you'll remember him. You're not alone. In his kingdom, he partakes this with us. I, I just love that picture. And for those first disciples who partook, imagine. You could, you could still feel maybe even the presence of someone who had been there with you. And they partook, and they remembered, and they were introspective, which we need to do. And then they thought outward toward what Christ was doing. See, the blood of Jesus was shed purposefully and planned, it was shed. It wasn't an accident, it wasn't spilt, it was shed, it was given. And every drop can cover every sin. And so when we partake of this, we remember our own walk and that he's still with us and wants us and walks with us. And he's at the table, and so let's pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we come to you now remembering your son Jesus who lived on this earth, he walked and talked and breathed and shared. He hurt, he healed, and he laughed. And yet in his perfect life, he walked to the cross and he gave his life and his blood, being sinless father, was that one, one sacrifice for all time now that saves us from our sins. And as we remember this, we pray so many things. First of all, thank you, Lord. The one answer to our sin problem, the one man who could take care of the problem that one man created was your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. And, and Father, we pray that you keep us mindful as we partake of this cup, of the, the blood it took to cover our sins, that we would walk in a way worthy of you, that as we stumble or as we fall or as we just blindly go our own way, you might grab our attention, Father, and we'd lovingly walk back because you want us back in relationship with you. And so let this cup remind us of the blessed relationship we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm reminded of the first century expression that went around as Christians could sense who Christians were. Um, they, of course, were not living in a, in a world in which they could so freely be who they were. They were resisted. And so the expression, Christ is risen, was shared. When a believer said, Christ is risen, another believer would respond back, He is risen indeed. And what a blessing it is that today it means as much to us that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.